I'm split across a couple. So Future Dairy is a partnership between Dairy Australia, Sydney University, Dairy Val, which is a, um, a company, a private dairy company. They um, actually work with the robots and dairy equipment. Um, so I work within that, so that's my PhD, but I'm also located here at Wagga and lecture at Charles Sturt University. And you might be wondering, well, why would a dairy researcher be talking at a beef forum? And I sort of, when I first got asked the question, I thought that was a question that came to mind straight away. And I think Heather hit the nail on the head um, with the answer to the question earlier on. There's no one in industry who's driving collaboration. Well, Heather, I'm the man for the job, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because I really believe strongly in this. I've been, um, so I started off my life in the beef industry and actually previous to that was a little bit in the pig industry when I was in undergrad university and then moved into the dairy game for my research and I go to dairy conferences, I go to beef days and the dairy guys are talking about, should we be worried about crossbreeding? What's the benefit of crossbreeding? The beef guys are already talking about crossbreeding but our past utilisation and our forage um, utilisation within our systems is nowhere near where the dairy guys are at. So they're talking about genomics of ryegrasses and the potential yields in developing um, new genetics of ryegrasses uh, in New Zealand. The Australasian Dairy Science Symposium we went to the end of last year the huge sections on genetics in grasses and we're not even at that stage but we're in the, a different, totally different stage of genomics in beef cattle, the actual cattle side of it. So um, I really want you to start thinking about your feed base and I love the word feed base, it's a fairly newish term within the industry, we used to just talk about pastures but feed base, I think it's probably one of our most important things in our business and one of the areas that we can probably make the most change, the biggest change to our um, profit within our business and take key messages home from today and actually implement them at home and make big differences to our bank balances at the end of the year. So a feed base could be anything. Typically we think about um, grazing in, in a beef cattle situation. You see dairy cow there grazing brassicas. It can be our conserved forages. In this photo up here we've got um, conserved maize but it could be uh, at home. Typically in a beef operation around here we might have a whole crop cereal silage or a, um, a pasture based silage or a hay. We can also have our feed base made up of grains or bought in feed is what we talk about in the dairy industry a lot. Bought in feed rather than home grown food. Now the concept I want to get across today is that our land's worth a lot of money. Yet thousand dollars, two thousand dollars an acre, maybe more in some instances. If we both had, and I like to think of a, a say a hectare as a silo. If we both had the same silo and we both got a 40 tonne silo and we both got 40 tonnes of grain in the top and some bloke over here, he's harvesting his 40 tonnes out of the bottom of the silo and putting it into his livestock production. And the other guy next door, he's only harvesting 20 tonnes of that 40 tonnes that he's paid for out of the bottom of the silo. Who's going to be better off? Who's making more efficient use of that feed base? So at the moment, we've got land, a very similar land to neighbours. Um, it varies across our region here. But are we making the best utilisation of that silo of feed? We get similar rainfall in. Can we put more fertiliser in to grow more of that feed and can we utilise it or harvest it in, in better ways? Okay, so can we grow different things, grow different forages to grow more, but also harvest it as well on the other side? So if we, if we wouldn't want to waste 20 tonnes of grain. If you'd paid for 40 tonnes of grain to arrive on your place and you wasted 20 tonnes of that, well, but we let it go in the pasture because we're not able to measure it as easily. I should say not in the pasture, but in the paddock, whether it's a pasture or a forage crop or whatever. We let it go. Um, because we can't measure it as easily. So, moving on. Just quickly, what is Future Dairy? And I thought you'd like this little photo here. So, Future Dairy, the collaboration I spoke about before, been running since 2004. Two major streams for the project. And as you can imagine, it's like the Beef CRC. You could talk for days on all the different little projects going on in here. But they've identified two main factors in a dairy farm for the future um, uh, industry to prosper, I suppose. One was, a big thing was labour. Um, and that came out from a lot of social aspects to it. Uh, it was a lot of social research, I should say. So dairy farmers saying that labour is a big issue and not just finding the labour, but actually the, the amount of time. And you guys all know that's why you're in the beef or sheep or cropping game is that you don't want to be milking cows morning and afternoon, seven days a week. Um, and neither do these guys. So the big push in the, at the moment with Future Dairy 3 is that they've got a, um, this was located at, at Camden. This particular photo is not from Camden, but a robotic rotary dairy. Um, and so they're, they're potentially going to be able to milk up to sort of seven or eight hundred cows on a voluntary basis. So the cows just come in, the robot arm comes out, milks them, it's a really neat setup. Um, the way of the future, and there's commercial operation in uh, Tasmania that's got one operating now. Um, so have a bit of a play on the internet and have a look at it, it's a very cool setup. Um, 
<laughs> Wouldn't that be handy? Wouldn't it be very handy? Um, and the second, uh, the second main project was, was incorporating their feed base and a, and a project we called complementary forage rotations. I came in on the back end of that. Um, they've done a, a fair bit of work beforehand. Um, and really, when we look at it, labour and feed base are two major issues in the dairy industry and they're probably two major issues in beef industry and the sheep industry, really. Like, they're, to me, getting cheap labour, so or efficient use of our labour to make it cheap enough um, and to get a really efficient and cost-effective feed base to either boost production um, or make more margin and what we've already got a really key importance. So what do we need feed-based research? This stuff comes from the dairy industry, so the decline in terms of trade, cost of inputs is increasing. Does that sound familiar in the beef game? Yeah? Um, the competition for land and water is increasing. So the land price is going up, mining's taking a lot of land, Hunter Valley for instance, cost of water's going up, the water availability is going down in general terms, the costs of um, grain or off farm feed in, um, or boarding feed in the dairy industry, that's generally increasing. We have seasonal fluctuations but generally increasing as demand for grain around the world is going to increase. As we say beef demand's going up but food demand generally is going up. Can we divert that grain into livestock production, this is the dairy game. Um, so similar for beef sort of situation, land of pr lands, um, price of land's going up, the availability of decent land is going down whether it's through urbanisation or mining or forestry or, or whatever else. Um, and what they decided was how do we, how, how do we make the best utilisation, so intensify the land, utilisation of the land that we've got um, through the use of forages and so they called this um, system, a complementary forage rotation, and it was designed, and I'm, I'll explain it a little bit more um, later, but it was basically designed on uh, principles of complementarity at the plant and soil level, so something that works with utilising different nutrients during the season, um, working at the whole farm system level, so it's got to fit within the whole farm system, and it's got to fit with the animal and plant or animal nutrition level too, so it's got to be able to balance an animal's diet. Now the dairy guys are very big on balancing cows' diets on a daily basis. Um, we aren't as big on that, but there's no reason why we shouldn't be either. Um, and the production gains that potentially we could have um, if we were able to balance our cows' diets, not from our cows that we've got at the moment, but potentially we need to produce twice as much beef, we could run a lot more cows if we had more forages in the system. That's my, one of my points I'm going to send you home with today. So this work was conducted at Camden. Um, and there's lots of research about um, increasing pasture utilisation, but this is all about if dairy farmers can um, utilise oh, 14 tonnes or 20 tonnes of dry matter from per hectare, so uh, would anyone under have an understanding of where beef producers would be at in this region about utilising pasture in their system? We're probably around about the good guys would be, uh, when I say good guys, it's really hard to measure because we're not measuring it as such, but they, they would be up sort of towards the seven tonnes sort of area and the, the lower down would probably be the three tonnes and potentially a bit less than that. So, so are you comparing rainfall, you know? Yeah, so this is, so what, I will talk about that, like rainfall, irrigation and dry land, yep. So what we've, it, within the dairy game, and this is um, more, so dry land dairy, more towards southern Victoria, they saw their maximum pasture utilisation is about the 14 tonnes, sort of, that's sort of roughly where it is. Under an irrigated system, it's about 20 tonnes of dry matter. So that's a big difference is the dairy guys have, if they've got irrigation, it's a big difference. Yeah, and so this is what we'll talk about here in a second. Um, so basically what happens if, if a dairy farmer is able to utilise his pasture more effectively, gets to the 14 tonnes in dry land, gets to 20 tonnes in irrigated, how can he take that next step above? How can we have more milk produced per hectare, in our situation more beef produced per hectare, above that? So key message, we need to utilise what we've got already. But how can we take that next step above that? Um, so they came up with this complementary forage rotation intensified system, utilising sh um, short rotation maize um, for silage in the summertime, followed by brassica, like immediately followed by brassica, harvest day after brassica's in, uh, grazed, and then followed by field pea. Um, complementarity here is that brassica's high nutrient um, demand, followed by a leguminous crop followed by a maize which um, is able to utilise some of that nitrogen that the legumes fix in the soil and is able to fill a feed gap in our autumn in a dairy situation. Yep, Definitely don't take this message home and start growing maize on a dry land situation around here. That's not the message at all. This is an irrigated system at Camden <laughs> and it's just showing you the potential of it. So what they were able to show was they grew 40 tonnes of dry matter per hectare 
lot, fair bit of irrigation. Maize was prioritised in the irrigation and a fair few nutrients on there. That's a big amount of feed to intensify feed based on a dairy farm. So all of a sudden, this situation means that you've gone from 20 tonnes per hectare of pasture to a 40 tonne system. Well, you're talking about, you know, labour efficiency. You'd have someone full time doing that, wouldn't you? Well, essentially, you could, that, and that's where we come down. We all, often say we don't have time to measure pasture, we don't have time to do certain things. If we get extra production out of it, we could actually employ half a labour unit or a casual person or, or sometimes a full labour unit to do a lot of these things for us. Um, so the, the actual labour part of this project is the robots, um, and that's all about utilising our labour more efficiently, but also having young people actually half interested in milking a dairy cow, because they don't actually have to milk a dairy cow anymore, um, and, and getting the industry to, to drive forward. So, um... Michael, that would, be, that would be a lot of water, using that. Yeah, but... Like yeah, it was. Th th I'm not saying there wasn't a bit of water in there, but it's really efficient use of water. And that's where we've got to, we've got to drive our, our thinking, and talking about methane output before, it's not actually the, the total output, it's the output per unit of production. And so per um, litre of milk or per kilograms of milk solids is what sort of talk about in the dairy industry and that's how they get paid. Per kilogram of milk solids, this is really water use efficient because maize is one of the most water use efficient um, crops going around. It might use about, oh, it, dep it totally depends on rainfall, to, so you're matching rainfall to it, but you might use four or five megalitres of water per hectare to grow it, but it, you grow in 22 plus tonnes. In northern Victoria it might be 20 tonnes, but in Camden it's 24, 25 tonnes. North Coast, they're growing it, North Coast, New South Wales I should say, they're growing it without irrigation and getting over 20 tonnes of dry matter per hectare. So should you so. do it dry matter per meg and not dry matter per hectare? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I've got all that data too if you wanted to go down that track, but I just so figured that we... It's not necessarily about hectare, is it? With irrigation it's about per meg of water. Absolutely, and how to utilise that water at different times of the year. So. Prioritising maize in the irrigation system um, means that you use it on your most efficient plant first. If you run out of water when you get to your field pea, well, you've got spring rainfall, well, in theory, <laughs> winter spring rainfall, um, to, to grow that. So you might have a little bit of a yield loss, but the irrigation water is not as critical at that time of the year. Um, I've steered clear of talking about, or I'm trying to steer clear of talking about irrigation because I thought that we were more down the dry land path. So this is just sort of more setting the scene as to some of it starting to drive our thinking and, and really start challenging our thinking about what our feed base is delivering us at home, I guess, is, is a key point. So what they did then, lots of modelling, lots of work, plot trials went on, incorporated into a farmlet system, 100 cows farmlet system. They incorporated pasture, so 65% pasture, 35% of this complementary forage rotation, a complementary forage system, came back 26 tonnes of dry matter per hectare. So I said the upper limit before was about 20 tonnes of dry matter per hectare. They were able to get an extra six tonnes over a whole farm system. So they had 40 tonnes on a small area, and they had, um, so that actually in a, in a larger scale, that dropped back to about 38 tonnes. And then they, um, they were actually managing the pastures really well and got a bit over 22 tonnes per hectare from their pastures. So that was measuring every day and allocating on what had grown. Um, and so they knew exactly all the measurements, allocating cows exactly what they wanted to harvest based on growth rate. So in this situation you could easily, in a dairy situation, easily employ someone just to manage your feed base for the extra production they were getting out of here. Um, and we're talking 30,000 litres per hectare of milk in uh, average farmer situation, Hunter Valley sort of thing, you, you might be talking sort of the, the 10 to 20,000 litres per hectare. So big increases in production. But we had irrigation water. Okay, so don't take these figures as I've got to get 40 tonnes of dry matter, just take the concept out of it. Okay, these guys are driving this feed base, putting crops in at different times of year to fill feed gaps. So Farina, um, Santiago Farina, he's an um, uh, Argentinian um, guy who finished his PhD just when I was starting. He's back in Argentina, he's actually setting the world on fire, trying to get collaboration between the uh, farmers and the, the dairy research organisations and across industry back there. So exactly what Heather was talking about before. Um, he was able to prove this was less risky. And I'm just really summarising this quickly for you. But milk price had the highest impact on operating profit within the, the study. Um, very similar to we, we, get, um, we get caught up in the, how we're analysing our business and we often leave out our, um, our price received for our beef because we often say we don't, have a, we don't have control over that. We do have some control over that. But just showing that milk price had the biggest impact on operating profit. Um, and the, the, one of the key points out of it was that forage crops had a lower interannual variability. So what that's saying is that because they were able to irrigate the forage crops and the forage crops grew, grew at times of the year, so the, the uh, 
brassica in the autumn actually grew on a fair bit of rainfall. Um, they, were, they had a, a certain amount of less variability in their pasture during the year. And we see that, that's sort of a common concept. So our pasture growth goes up and down, and year on year it's very different. Whereas if we were able to grow a short term forage crop on some sort of half reliable rainfall, that forage crop might change from six tonnes to five tonnes each year. Or, you know, seven tonnes, four tonnes is not a big variation, whereas our pasture actually growing might change from nine or ten tonnes, and that's probably what we could potentially grow here. Or, yeah, I'm open for discussion there. Um, uh, but then it, it could actually drop down to three or four tonnes, or two tonnes, or zero in some years, I suppose. <laughs> Um, so what, I, what I've been doing, working on commercial farms, got four case study farms in Northern Victoria, four in the Hunter Valley, there's actually six in the Hunter Valley but I'm just using four of those farms, monitored them every fortnight for 12 months, um, some really key things out of that, pasture quality, Northern Victoria, as soon as you hit the start of December, my ryegrass samples, so bring them back here, get feed quality assessments done, ryegrass is really um, high quality, so we often say it's, oh, it might be 10 megajoules or 11 megajoules, some of my samples coming back in springtime of 12 megajoules plus because we're taking grab samples we're not grazing all the, like not grabbing it um, in a typical pasture cut you cut it off of the ground and you get a lot of that fibrous bottom to it the uh, in Hunter Valley some of the stuff was coming back at 13 megajoules um, of energy so it's actually really high quality start of December some of the rye grasses 8.8 .8, 8 and a half megajoules of energy so all this with big drop off at the start of December and you probably see that in a beef cattle operation when you're trying to finish steers off to either be slaughtered or go to a food lot and you think I'll oh, just hold them that extra month are uh, they putting on much weight over that December period? And I think the, uh, one of the keys from using HGPs before might be in your heifers or something to get them finished earlier before we hit that summer um, dry spell. So what's happening on these commercial farms? Basically, Hunter Valley guys, a few of those adopted it. It actually works in practice, this intensification system with irrigation water. Um, the Northern Victoria guys, we haven't pushed them to adopt it. I'm actually using a lot of their data for modelling. Um, so I've got a lot of their uh, production data which allows me to then use fairly robust models to make changes on their farms. Um, it's a fairly sort of intensive process. What's it showing? There's huge potential to lift production on these farms and do it profitably. profitably. And I'm actually moving into the whole risk analysis phase now of that project. Um, another really interesting project, if you're on um, the internet to have a look at, is the 3030 project. It's um, a <laughs> uh, collaboration between Dairy Australia, Melbourne University, Vic DPI and probably a few others, so um, I know I'm probably, you know, get quoted by some other people, I've left them out. But basically what they were looking at was an increase of 30% return on assets um, through 30% increase in the amount of homegrown feed. Yep, so dairy farmers are big on homegrown or bought-in feed, and that's what most beef cattle guys uh, would be focused on, homegrown feed. So that's our pasture and silage or hay that's conserved homegrownly. Um, what, they, what did they show? That shift in pasture supply, we all have heaps of feed in spring. So we don't need to grow more food in spring. That's pretty much taken. Shifting pasture supply into summer shoulder. So they talk, talk about this summer shoulder. This is all dry land system down in um, southern Victoria. Um, is fescues was one of the things they used. Um, provides feed at an opportune time of the year where we don't actually have other quality food. So ryegrass is a key plant. Yep, no worries. R ryegrass is our key plant. Um, high quality, good production for our, our systems, but it when we hit a dry period, um, it doesn't work as well as other food. So they use fescue, they're able to shift food supply which increase profitability. Whole crop cereal silage has a real um, production potential I suppose, so you know nine, ten tonnes, John Pilts has done work around here um, of silage per hectare. Um, that can be fed back into a system in, in autumn, in a beef cattle system if we've got an autumn calving cows or we're weaning um, spring cattle or whatever else and we need to feed them something, could r work really well. Interesting thing here, farmlets that they, um, uh, that they were monitoring, I suppose, using them in the trial, 12% return on assets. It's quite high, I, I think, and puts them in the top 10% of dairy farmers. People say you can't make money out of milk. Um, they're probably not having a look at some of this data because I think the dairy industry has a real bright future, the same as the beef guys do. So how does this all fit in the beef system? Well, I think we need to analyse how much feed we can grow at home. Do we want a more grazable feed at different times of the year? Um, where is our feed deficit, I suppose? Do we lift overall stocking rates? Do we run more cows or do we trade more um, cattle? Or do we reduce supplementary feeding? So there's two different things here. If we're buying feed in all the time or we're always feeding supplementary feed at a certain time of year, can we replace that supplement with a grazable crop? Um, or do we lift our overall stocking rate? Um, better hit market specifications. If we get to the end of our 
um, ryegrass, annual grass growing season, so let's, let's call it the end of November, do it, and our cattle aren't quite up to spec, so they're only 440 kilos to hit a feedlot and we want them to be 480, can we keep them for another month to, with a grazable crop or something else to, to better hit that market specification? Just did this quickly at home, just to show you that it's not impossible. I don't really know why I bothered with it, because <coughs> we've all seen this graph before, um, of our food supply and food demand. So this is our farm at home, at along, trying to work out where we had gaps, and it's pretty typical. It's what we've seen in ProGraze before. It's what, if anyone's done a Graze with Profit course, anyone done any pasture measurements or demand, anything at all, there's an MLA beef ca um, calculator. I spent a bit of time, on this is my own spreadsheet, setting it all up, and I got to the end of it and thought, why did I bother with it? Because it tells me the same picture as what I knew already, that autumn calving herd, deficient in winter and deficient in summer um, in terms of food supply, freshly grown food supply. We've got this huge amount of spring growth. So what's a simple concept? So what are some of the options? We can look at a perennial summer food, so lucerne or chicory. Chicory's worked really well with a, um, one of the guys I know well at uh, Gundagai. Managed properly. We used chicory a lot during the drought and people hammered it into the ground because it grew. But managed properly, he's got it persisting for three years at least. I've seen it on dairy farms persist for five years or greater. Just with a simple rotational graze, let it go to seed, it'll grow quite high um, in that second year. It's got to, it's got to go through a winter, um, vernalisation to go through winter, go to seed, let it seed down and, and you'll have a standard chicory in the... Um, provide quality feed at an opportune time of the year, so it's actually probably worth more to you than your yeah, annual feed is. Um, and then you can look at your winter and feed and annual sh um, feed options, so short term feed, whether your traditional oats and winter cereal peas or brassicas. And brassicas are the thing I've been sort of looking at a fair bit to provide feed, standing feed, quality feed at opportune times of the year, whether it's early summer or in autumn, to have a, have a stand of brassicas that can last over summer, quite sort of drought tolerant, without some of our summer rainfall it'll respond if it's been grazed, but provide it feed at the start of autumn when our rye grasses haven't kicked off, and it might be a, a feed that we can wean um, like cattle onto, so either spring calves or even bigger autumn calves onto in the autumn time, um, but, or it might be a fact we can put dry cattle on there to put a bit extra condition on them before they hit their, the winter. Um, so, really simple uh, system change that I'm looking at at home, and I just thought I'd share it with you just before I finish up, was um, basically we're looking at harvesting a, a, a paddock of pasture. I shouldn't say ryegrass, because there's not a lot of ryegrass, it's actually a lot more phalaris and whatever else in it. Trying to, going to harvest it earlier. So, one thing we have to uh, change our minds a little bit in that triple crop system that I mentioned before, was we weren't trying to maximise yield on any one particular crop. It was all about optimising the yield from the whole 12 months system. So, I'm just going to look to harvest silage earlier, broadcast the forage rape seed. We're, predictions are, this year to eliminate some of the risk, is Bureau saying it's going to be mild, it's going to be a bit wetter than average spring. So I'm hoping to get a bit of spring rainfall onto a brassica that will give us quality feed at time of the year when we don't have quality feed, so coming into summer. Um, and hopefully if we can work that out, it should come out at um, a fairly cheap uh, uh, feed, I suppose. It's $60 a tonne dry matter um, compared to buying feed in or harvesting um, silage and feeding it back out, which can become quite costly.